Hello, my name is David White and I'm an acting assistant curator here at Sydney Living Museums. Welcome to today's Discover SLM talk and I extend a particularly warm welcome to our members, donors and supporters. I would like to begin by acknowledging the Baramatical people on whose land I am currently on. I pay my respects to elders past, present and future. Curators at SLM are constantly discovering new stories about the people, places and things we care for at our 12 sites. During this talk series, we'll be sharing some of this research with you as we explore a range of subjects from Christmas puddings to mug shots. So please join us every Tuesday at 4 to 4.30 to hear our curators delve into new and exciting topics. Today's speaker is Holly Short. Holly is curator of digital assets who, who works with the analog and digital collections at Sydney Living Museums. Holly specializes in collection digitization and digital asset management for a range of object formats and currently leads a digitization project in the Capital Programs Division. Holly is enchanted with the houses, places and collections of SLM. Her research focuses on photography, collections, histories, materiality, image making technology and practice. Holly has a particular focus on the New South Wales Police Forensic Photography Archive and the Icon Studio Street Photography Archive. Please, if you have any questions for Holly, add it to the Zoom chat and hopefully we'll be able to answer it at the end of this talk. Thank you, Holly. Thanks, David. And thanks to everyone for joining in the Zoom today. Um, uh, can I just start by acknowledging the Gadigal people uh, and their um, and pay my respects to elders present, past and emerging. Um, I'm just gonna turn my camera off and then I'll be sharing my presentation so I can talk you through the um, slides that I've prepared today. Great. So it's wonderful to be sharing some of the techniques and practices used by the early police and prison photographers in New South Wales as evidenced by the New South Wales Police Photography Archive held by the Justice and Police Museum. I will refer to this collection as the FPA throughout the presentation. The photographs I'm showing are all from this archive unless they're otherwise credited. The FPA is estimated at 180,000 items and was created between circa 1910 and 1964. The photographs are a record of Sydney's people and places. As long as there was need to investigate, the police were unrestricted in what, where and whom they photographed. The resulting images depict every imaginable aspect of life in Sydney during the early to mid 20th century. The people who came to the attention of the police, the streets of the city and expanding suburbs, the picturesque harbour and beaches, the lounge rooms, bedrooms, kitchens and backyards that through unforeseen or unfortunate circumstance became the focus of the police photographer's camera. However, the indexes that explain the order and why these photographs were taken had been lost years ago. Despite this absence, the archive offers much evidence for interpretation and provides insights not recorded in mainstream practices of photography in Australia. Importantly, this is an archive of photographic negative formats. This evidence provided by the museum objects serves as leads for investigation into the subject depicted and to the craft of analog photography. In the analog process, the negative is a step to creating the printed image. By their very nature, these objects require a process of interpretation from negative to positive image. The different size negatives were used concurrently, indicating the range of formats and changes in photographic technologies across 50 years. The negative is the source of the photographic image. They communicate the level of photographic expertise required to be a practitioner at this time. They also provide clues about the size of the camera and the exposure settings through visual technical qualities like depth of field and sharpness. The discoloration, residue of chemicals and silvering of emulsions all indicators of the process and their lives as photographic objects for 100 years. These are the objects that the photographer himself, and they were policemen during this period, loaded into their cameras at the time of exposure. They were then processed in dark rooms and printed into positive photographs, but not before they were inscribed and sometimes even edited. 
The monochromatic emulsions contain visual representations and provide material evidence of the photographic practice. The negatives have been annotated and bear marks, scratches, fingerprints, all evidence of their use as working records. These handmade editions are vital for understanding the content depicted, dating the photograph and further research of the images. Ma digitization, management and research of this collection is one part of my role with Sydney Living Museums. The materiality of the photographic object format is flattened in the digitized image. Therefore, examining the physical object helps to read the image and to contextualize how and when the materials were created and used. This presentation will focus on the earliest plates in the collection, those that depict the criminals, suspects and others that came before the prison and police photographer's lens. The photographing of criminals and suspects for identification purposes had been common practice across the world since the invention of photography. However, it was not until the late 1880s when French policeman Alphonse Bertillon devised a formal system for the photographing, measuring and filing of information about bodies and scenes that a standardized process was defined. Bertillon's standards were the first to dictate a person be photographed both front facing and in profile views. The photographs, physical measurements and other data was added to a card then at, um, filed in a revolutionary system that provided an efficient process for organization and retrieval of criminal records. Prison and police departments all over the world soon implemented these practices or the fundamentals of them. Bertillon's methods became outdated, but not before the visual conventions of the mugshot photographs had been established. In New South Wales, photographers within the police and prisons took portraits from the late 19th century. And these practices continue today in one form or another. Within the archive, the portrait negatives broadly cover the period from the 19 teens to the late 1930s. These are predominantly glass place negatives, but include some plastic negatives from the late 1920s. Photographers worked with analog cameras in their studios or on the job, then processed and printed their work in dark rooms. The prints made were collated and distributed for official purposes. This is a photograph that caught my attention. A beautiful example of a natural lit portrait taken by Sydney police, probably in 1926. The subject is lit by ambient sunlight flooding onto the subject, perhaps through a window or open door. The photograph is well composed, well exposed. It's sharp and has been developed with even tonality across the plate. The example shows the expertise of the photographic work being carried out by police at the time. However, the plate bears no name in inscription, just the number 1167. This is the case for many negatives taken in this period. We may never identify this individual, but perhaps he's a suspect or person of interest in an investigation. However, the aspect of this photograph that really had me intrigued, and I hope you can see this in the digital image where I'm putting my mouse right now, was the wash mark that you can see across the area where the head and shoulders appear in the um, digitized image on the left. On inspection of the plate within the archive, the emulsion provided surprising details that led me to re-evaluate this portrait. The face of the man depicted has been retouched. Retouching and editing the emulsion was common darkroom practice for photographers. It allowed them to reduce, enhance or modify the final print. Parts of the negative might also be completely painted over or scratched off to blend tones or isolate details before the print was made. There are many historic manuals with instructions for how to complete this type of darkroom image editing. The work was a type of Photoshop magic prior to the digital image age we expect in photography today. Um, I located some 1920s essays on retouching negatives in the Australasian Photo Review a journal for camera workers published locally by Sydney Photographic Supply Company, Baker and Rouse. An article by J. Kretz from 1923 called Common Sense Retouching instructs the reader in different aspects of this art form and includes a diagram illustrating the type of marks or touches that might be applied to an emulsion. Like many darkroom practices, retouching was an aspect of photographic expertise that went undetected in the final print. The author notes, a little careful practice on an old negative will be necessary to get the required knack 
as instructions on the matter can only be very general in scope. Retouches rubbed a quick drying medium, popularly known as dope, onto the emulsion side of the negative in preparation for their work. The sealed gelatin emulsion was then protected and any unsuccessful retouching marks could easily be removed. Graphite pencils of varying hardness or Indian ink was applied over the top of the prepared area. This plate clearly shows that the medium has been applied to the emulsion in preparation for the pencil edits. The article also states, and I quote, dark circles under the eyes and the crow's feet at their corners should be eliminated. On the pupil of the eye, there should usually be a triangular catch light. Eyebrows may be arched a little or may be softened if they are too dark by the careful application of the pencil, end quote. These are the exact areas that have been retouched in the lightest tones of the negative. These will appear as the darkest shadow areas in the final print. In another article from 1926 of the same publication, the author states that, and I quote, portraits of men usually require very little actual retouching, only a general cleanup and softening of two aggressive shadows, end quote. Again, this is true of the example shown. So the edits on this plate essentially reduce the depth of shadows that have been recorded, resulting in a smoothing out of wrinkles around the eyes and enhancing other features like the eyebrows in the final positive image. Importantly, with this information, we are caused to reframe the photograph in the context of this police archive and reassess who the sitter might be. It is worth uh, it is unlikely that the police would retouch a negative taken for investigation as this would interfere with the evidence provided by the photograph. With this in mind, perhaps this is a portrait of a policeman or a detective. The Department of Prisons created or commissioned portraits of criminals serving time in jails across New South Wales. The plates have detailed inscriptions which were vital for record keeping as the text was printed as part of the photographic print. They are also leads for researchers to find out more about the persons depicted and their crimes using historic, other historic sources. One of the earliest dated negatives in the FPA is this mugshot taken at Darlinghurst Jail, Sydney on the 23rd of June, 1910. There were two negatives made in the prescribed pose, each containing two front and profile views of James Wilson. Two images appear on a single plate, most likely taken on a single exposure. This is potentially because it allowed for two prints to be made from the negatives by way of contact printing. A contact print is when the negative is placed directly on top of photographic paper before exposure. After processing, this resulted in a photograph being printed 100% of the negative size, about five centimeters in height in the case of these prints. The photos were then added to the official record. Often, uh, so prison photographs like the one of Wilson were taken across New South Wales. There were jails in Albury, Grafton, Maitland and Darlinghurst until the state penitentiary at Long Bay, Sydney opened in 1914. These photographs were primarily used by the Department of Prisons for their paperwork and criminal records. Police officers were also given copies of the images to familiarize themselves with local criminals. The negatives were printed by the police photographers and remain part of the FPA. The creation of mugshots in regional jails was potentially facilitated by commercial photographers. Many of the images indicate they brought some of their studio portrait practices into the prisons. These photographs were all taken at Grafton Jail between 1917 and 1919. The men in these photographs all wear the same tie and have on a formal jacket, indicating that they were dressed up. Presumably these items of clothing were provided to the inmates by the portrait photographer. Conversely, the photographer might have normalized the subject through standardized dress. This is the case with a number of female prison portraits photographed at the State Reformatory for Women, Long Bay, between 1919 and 1921. The women all wear the same drab overshirts, and this certainly visually represses any sense of the individual in these photographs. The police also took portraits of people passing through the court system, often before they were formally charged, if they were charged at all. The special photographs, as the New South Wales Police called them, exist as approximately 2,500 negatives taken from the 19-teens to the 1930s. In these portraits, those subjects appear in their own clothes. 
The specials were probably used to familiarize police with the city's criminals. The informality and the lack of telltale signs that the person was in custody meant they could also be shown to witnesses without prejudicing them against the suspect. Seemingly, the police photography did not strongly dictate the suspect's choice of pose, perhaps to capture a more candid and for policing purposes, a more useful shot. Although the 1920 special seemed to follow, loosely follow long established conventions of mugshot photography, capturing the subject in a headshot and full length standing pose, the image content is far from formulated or consistent. The photographic beauty of these exposures combined with the suspect's individuality make it all too easy to forget the special's intended purpose as police mugshots. The different perspectives of the holding yard at Central Police Station are evidence that the photographer crafted each image on the day. Positioning his camera, focusing and deciding exposures according to the level of available light. Clearly this was more than a policeman just obeying protocol, if protocol then existed. This unique aesthetic is likely the work result of George Balfe Howard, a prominent police photographer in Sydney during the 1920s. Howard graduated from the New South Wales Police Depot in 1910. He evidently had an interest in photography from a young age. The press reported that he had purchased his first camera as a teenager and that the police had utilized his photographic expertise prior to his appointment as official photographer. In 1921, Howard was promoted to sergeant and took charge of the photographic section. In one newspaper, he was praised for introducing Sydney's Rogue Gallery, the library of bulky books in which the criminal activities of Australian citizens are recorded. Evidently, he was a diligent, intelligent and charming man with a talent for photography. Newspaper reports include admiring comments on his personal, professional and photographic abilities and describe him as tall and handsome. Howard left his position as the police photographer in 1929, taking up senior roles until his retirement 20 years later. There is strong evidence of a rapport between photographer and the subject. The range of compositions, posing and expression Howard captured through the specials is highly unusual. The resultant images resonate more with the studio or family portraiture genres. But the special photograph prints in the police record show more clearly the intention for the changes in Howard's photographic practice. There are two registers, one created between 1914, oh, sorry, created between 1914 and 1929 of, of special photographs held at the State Records Authority of New South Wales. These volumes have an index of name and feature the contact prints made from the special photograph negatives alongside handwritten annotations about the individual. Noticeably, there is a large disparity in the print size between the paired headshot and full length views of the earlier stated portraits. This is a result of the subject appearing at different scales in the negative. And, and you can see that on the top line, top right image, top cent, sorry, middle right image. The later pages show prints from the single negative that contain both views of the subjects. Those views are reproduced next to each other at a single scale and in a single photograph. The pages have also been printed with a template for each suspect. The pre-printed pages reinforce the planning and genius of Howard's development, clearly showing the outcome of his photographic innovation, moving from taking two separate photographs of his suspects to a single plate with two different views of the suspect. The prints show the suspect at a close crop. This is just a slice of the overall image that appears on the negative. It was the photographer's intention from the outset then to, to show just this portion of the image in the final record. This visual assessment makes it immediately obvious just how privileged we are to have the original negatives. The full frame image shows us, shows, allows us to see beyond the intended frame of reference. Arguably, it is the unprinted areas and incidental details, detective bystanders, pallet beds, cell doors that provide a greater understanding and broader narrative for the moment these portraits were taken. They hold a tonally superior photograph and, make, and allow us to make a first generation reproduction from the source image in the digitized image. The images made from these plates have a sharpness and clarity not evident in the prints from the volumes, now rippled from decades of being pasted into volumes. 
The archive also contains photographs depicting prominent boxers and wrestlers that toured Australia in the, 1390, in, in the 1930s and 40s. These negatives may have been commissioned or taken by police in relation to the police boys clubs they managed. Dave Shade was ranked one of the world's greatest middleweight fighters. Born Charles D. Shade in 1902, he came from a family of successful Californian boxers. He toured Australia in late 1933, fighting four bouts against local headliners, winning two and losing two. The media coverage of Shade's visit to Australia was substantial, and the series of photographs depicting him in the archive provide insight of this popularity and his time in Sydney, in and out of the ring. An article published in the Sydney Sportsman on the 11th of November, 1933, gives some flavour to the boxer's confidence and fighting character. The author also writes on some of his tastes, and I quote, Dave smokes a plain briar pipe and occasionally a huge cigar. He has a decided leaning towards good clothes and English made at that. And what I love about that statement is that the photograph within the collection seems to really epitomize what the author has said as Shade presents himself in a suit, smoking a cigar. Shade tallied up over 200 recorded fights in his lifetime. He died in 1983, age 81. During the late 1930s, police were increasingly focusing their cameras on the examination of scenes and evidence. In May 1938, on a black day for criminals, the Scientific Investigation Bureau was formed. Photography was now part of a growing arsenal of police investigative methods that included the collection of physical evidence, drafting scale plans of the scene, freehand drawing, making plaster casts and models, firearms identification, handwriting analysis, and the visual comparison of marks, ballistics, and impressions. PIX magazine profiled this work in the article titled Science Tracks New South Wales Crooks, published on the 21st of December, 1940, stating that within just two years of the Bureau's establishment, between 1938 and 1940, the workload had increased by more than four times. The work of the now roving mid-century photographer was enabled with developments in camera, film and flash technology. Police photographers now shot packs of plastic-based black and white sheet film in handheld analog press style cameras. The negatives dating from this period of the FPA predominantly depict policing work of this nature. The golden age of the mugshot had declined. Fantastic, Holly. Thank you very much for that. That was a that was a fascinating, um, great talk there. Um, Thank you, David. One question from Mel Flight: What is the life of a glass plate negative? Do they deteriorate? Do they have a limit on how many times they can be used to produce a photograph? Well, thanks, Mel, for that question. It's a great question. Um, the life of the glass plate negative, I think it really varies. Um, so the glass plate negatives were created or developed as um, dry plates manufactured between the 1880s and the 1950s and really their storage and the way that they're processed and um, yeah, kind of cared for is a big limitation or advantage to how they're going to last. So um, as long as you have a plate, you correctly expose it, you process it properly and you wash out all the residue chemistry and you keep it in a kind of, um, you know, an environment where there's not too much moisture, it's not too dry, then, it, then you will have a great um, life of the negative. Most of the plates in the FPA are quite robust aside from some, um, some deterioration, which is just due to the fact that they haven't been stored in museum collections <laughs> since they were created. So the main reason that glass plate negatives are um, susceptible to deterioration is because they are essentially a piece of glass with a silver gelatin emulsion on top. And that emulsion can fluctuate with the humidity and that can cause the grains of silver in the image to migrate to the surface. Uh, causing you know the silvering or also for the actual um, emulsion to delaminate which means the emulsion lifts up off um, off the actual plate of glass so um, yeah we're really lucky with our collection and and most of the the plates are stable and able to be digitized without putting any risk to the emulsion or the negative excellent thank you um a question for myself um were the police photographers specifically trained to take these kinds of photographs 
So I think um, at the time uh, that Howard was working, I'm, I'm not sure that it was part of the police training, um, just from the evidence that I have found in newspaper reporting, he had already had this interest in photography. It was obviously a specialist skill. You needed to have um, a technical knowledge of how to expose, use a camera. These cameras were completely manual. There was no automatic settings. You didn't see the image until after you went away. Um, from exposing it and processing it to tell if you've even had a successful um, a successful result. So it required not only on that camera craft, but also a knowledge of darkroom chemistry and processes to make um, the kind of images that you saw in the presentation. Oh, excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I might ask one more if that's quite okay. Um, how apparent is the change in technology over this, this period where the photographs uh, yeah, so um, I really focused on the earliest part of the archive, which is mainly the dry plate negatives. As I said, they were processed. Uh, they were they were processed in factories and um, manufactured from about the eighteen eighties to the nineteen fifties. But um, most of the plates were quite large, meaning they would have been uh, exposed on a large camera. But as more formats became available, the formats became more compact for the glass plates. So the largest glass plates we have in the collection are about eight by six inches and the smallest ones are about three and a quarter by four and a quarter inches. So there's a big um, difference in the physical size, meaning there's a big difference in the camera technology. But really by the time um, plastic based films come in in the 30s and 40s, um, you know, you can shoot a lot, a lot more negatives because they're uh, a lot more lightweight. And so it's at that point you really, and, and cameras become more handheld because they're a lot more lightweight as well. So you really see this kind of explosion in the amount of photographs that are taken because the technology allows people to go kind of wherever, wherever they need to investigate. Um, so that is a huge shift in what the police photography practice was. I think that other thing about that goes back to the photographic skill required. Those mm -hmm. um, lighter handheld cameras, they had more automatic settings. Um, and there was more ability, um, you know, I think the police were still learning about photography on the job when they worked as part of the SIB that was, as I said, was formed in 1938, but it wasn't such a craft, um, a craft then it was, it was a little bit um, easier because there were pre-prepared chemistry, um, you know, that you could, you could make instead of mixing your own. So um, there is a huge shift um, from kind of from the 1940s and an explosion of the amount of images that were taken due to the, those plastic based films. And then in the 50s uh, with 35 mil, 40s and 50s with 35 mil film um, coming in again. And you can imagine that's the smaller camera, the small camera too. Oh, cool, cool. Um, just to follow up on that, just again, for my personal, um, would they have had the processing uh, units in the police, um, in the police buildings or would they go somewhere specifically? Yeah, we know that at Central Police Station there were dark rooms, um, at least from, well, possibly earlier, but at least from the time that the SIB was set up. So in the 1930s, 31, 32, they had um, a small room there and one of the oral histories that we recorded with um, one of the police photographers, one of the early, early founding members of the Scientific Investigation Bureau said they had a dark room the size of the country dunny. So they were doing all the their work in-house and I guess because of the sensitivities around the investigation that was part of what they were required to do. Oh, excellent thank you thank you uh quite a few people saying thank you what an interesting talk you had as well so thank you enjoy so much. well thank you very much Holly um and for everybody please join us next Tuesday at four for a talk on 19th century domestic advice manuals with assistant curator Marina Grulang. Thanks again for joining us and everybody please enjoy your evening thank you. Thanks.